Ian, didn't you hear the captain calling? Carter asked. I moved my gaze from the notes on my desk and looked in his direction. He was standing by the entrance to my room, hands on his hips. He looked furious and impatient. What's going on? I asked. We have an emergency. HQ wants to send us on a rescue mission. Rescue? Who? I raised my eyebrows. No idea. The briefing's already started. Come on, let's get to the control room. Before I could ask him anything else, he turned and went down the hallway. I arranged my notes neatly and exited my room. The corridor leading down echoed with my footsteps and Carter's own in the distance. The spaceship was big enough for me to still sometimes lose direction, but at least it was equipped with gravitational panels, so we could get around more easily without floating and getting disoriented, like in the early stages of the simulation. I turned right at the corner and I saw Carter stopping in front of the control room door. He turned around and waited for me to get closer. Once I did, he pressed the big square button next to the door, which made it slide sideways. Immediately, we were hit by the sound of murmurs, as our other crew members discussed something around the holographic map in the middle. Behind the crew was a row of control panels sitting in front of a huge pane of glass. I glanced at the dark space beyond the glass, filled with hundreds of stars in the distance, unreachable still to mankind. It often made me realize how insignificant we are and how easily we can get swept away in an instant in this cold abyss and nobody would ever even know. I was shaken back to reality by Captain Adam's stern voice. Ian, late again, sit down, he said. The crew consisted of six members all together, and we had mandatory meetings every morning and evening to go through the list of inspections. So when Carter called me for an unexpected meeting at 5pm, I knew that something must have gone terribly wrong. I sat down and waited for the captain to speak. He said, Earlier today, there was an incident on board the ISS-14. We don't know what exactly happened, but supposedly there are casualties and Earth lost contact with them. HQ wants us to go there immediately and provide rescue to anyone alive. But that place is pretty far away, the team medic Riley said. It'll take us at least a few hours to get there, and we're not rescue services. Yeah, but there's no one closer to them than us, Adam said. Now I know that this is not our line of work, but it has to be us. We go there, look for any survivors, and go back home. Wait, what about the mining operation? James asked. HQ wants to put it on hold. Right now, the priority is rescuing the ISS-14 crew and escorting them back home. Ah, fine. I'll start the engine, Hank, the pilot said. He stood up and went to the control room, with Carter and the two of them pressed a series of buttons. Every crew member was trained to pilot the ship, but only Carter and Hank could do it outside of any emergency situations. The ship hummed to life and the floor under our feet slightly vibrated. The view outside had started rotating to the right, making the stars dance across the window. When it stopped, it was impossible to tell which direction we were facing. However, the pilots somehow knew it from the radar and were able to determine which direction to move in. The ship started moving forward slowly but gained speed gradually. It looked like we were pinned in one spot, but I knew that with each passing second, we covered miles of the inhospitable vacuum of space. There, Hank leaned in his chair. And we should be there in about three hours. Well, keep your eyes open, the captain said, and try to see if you can get in contact with them in the meantime. He stood up and left the room. I followed and went back to the crew quarters. I closed the shutters on my window and sat down on my bed. 
although some of the crew members enjoyed the unique view from the windows in their rooms, I tended to avoid gazing outside, especially if I was left alone with my thoughts. Staring out into the endless nothingness out there for prolonged periods of time made me feel claustrophobic and trapped. I knew that we were relatively close to home, but our planet was only visible as a tiny dot in the distance at any given time, with every other direction around us being infinite miles of empty space. For the first few days, I would glance through the window towards the Earth every few hours, afraid that our ship would drift away and that we would lose sight of our planet, getting lost forever in the unforgiving cold dark, so unknown to man. I knew, of course, that no such thing could really happen, but the nagging feeling wouldn't abate. After a while of sitting on my bed, I went to join Hank and Carter in the control room. The two of them were casually chatting by the control panel when they saw me join and offered me to join in on the conversation. So, I was just telling Carter that the guys in the ISS-14 are probably just blackout drunk. Hank chuckled and craned his neck in my direction. What do you think? I don't know. It's strange to just go and lose contact like that. They might have had a serious issue, I said. Yeah, well, whatever the case, we'll find it soon. We're almost there, you see that? Carter said and pointed to the window. I squinted and realized that he was pointing at a dot in the distance. As minutes went by, the dot grew closer and more and more prominent shapes gradually became apparent. It began to take the shape of a man-made flying object, and I recognized its disproportionately large wings as solar panels, reflecting sunlight. Well, it's still there and it seems still intact, Hank said. He leaned in and pressed a button on the control panel. As he held it like that, he said, Now we can see them. Everybody get down here. In a matter of minutes, everyone was in the control room and the ISS-14 was a lot closer and bigger, displaying more and more visible details on the structure, like joints, pressurized modules, etc. Adams pressed a button on the panel and said, this is the U.S. Collector 3. Does anyone copy? He released the button and we waited in silence. Nothing but the humming of the ship was heard. Adams pressed the button and spoke again. This is the U.S. Collector 3. ISS-14, do you copy? No response. Adams sighed. Well, I guess we're going in. Bring us in closer, Hank. Ian. He looked at me. Suit up. I gave him a silent nod of agreement and proceeded to the lockers. I donned my suit and put my helmet on. I double checked if the thrusters on the boots were functioning, refilled the oxygen tank and made sure that everything was tightly secured. Once that was done, I proceeded down to the airlock. Riley was waiting in front and inspected my gear once more to make sure that everything was safe. All right, you're good to go, she said, giving me a pat on the shoulder. I pressed the button to open the airlock and stepped inside. In front of me was the second airlock door and a small round window, the final line of defense that separated me from a potentially painful demise. Riley pressed the button again and sealed the door behind me. I attached the safety cord to my suit and pulled down the lever on the left side of the wall. Depressurizing airlock. Stand by. A computerized voice announced. I glanced through the round window facing the interior of the ship and I smiled at Riley. I'll be back in a bit, I said encouragingly. Airlock depressurized. Opening airlock ready. I pressed the button next to the second door. It opened with a hiss and instantly everything except my breathing went silent. The weight of my body was lifted and I was floating midair. I used the thrusters to propel myself out of the airlock and finally stepped into the vast, empty space. 
That initial moment felt nauseating at first. Leaping out of the spaceship and expecting to see ground beneath you, but instead being met with an endless abyss which threatened to swallow you whole. The ISS-14 towered above me now, much larger up close than I suspected it would be, a silent behemoth which took up almost the entire view in front. The docking bay was right in front of me, so I proceeded there as quickly as the thrusters would allow me. Despite being able to only go 8 miles per hour, I didn't worry about the speed, since I had enough oxygen to go for at least 6 hours, so hopefully I would be back to the ship by then. Ian, do you copy? Carter's voice came through the radio. Yep, loud and clear, I responded. Alright, listen. We scanned the area with thermals and there's no sign of anyone being alive on board the station. What? Are you sure? Maybe the device malfunctioned. Eh, definitely not, because we picked up a sign of life outside the ship. Uh, repeat that last, I said. There's indication that one of the crew members is spacewalking outside the ship. See that gray node just around the upper right hand solar panel? He should be around there. Roger that, I said and looked up. Beyond the top of the station was exactly what was under it. Endless, vast void. It was a long ascent, especially because of the speed of the thrusters, but I slowly made my way up. Halfway there, I stopped at the site in front of me. Holy crap, I mumbled. Ian, you okay? James asked. I stared in bewilderment, unable to respond. The airlock which led inside the station was wide open. That was not uncommon if astronauts went on repair missions which were short, but what bothered me here was the fact that both airlock doors were wide open, letting out all the air. Guys, I said, something bad happened here. Both airlock doors are wide open. There was silence on the other end until Riley simply uttered a dumbfounded. What? Uh, probably human error, I said. That's impossible, Adam scoffed. The system would have warned them tenfold. You would have to be a complete idiot to make a mistake like that. Well then I can't explain this, I said and continued ascending. Pretty soon I reached the top and had a good view of the entire station. The place seemed completely undamaged so it made sense to me that someone simply made a mistake when opening the airlock. Any signs of survivors? Adams asked. I scanned the area and at first saw nothing. And then I noticed it. An astronaut blended with the white exterior of the station just floating around upside down. He showed no signs of movement, so I assumed he was either dead or unconscious. I see something. Hold up. I leaned forward and activated the thrusters once more. As I got closer, I tried to speak into the radio to avoid startling the crew member, in case he was still alive. This is Ian Nielsen. Does anyone from the ISS-14 copy? As I suspected, there was no response, so I simply said... We're here to rescue you. Try not to move while I attach the safety cord to you. I got close enough to the astronaut to grab his hand and turn him around. I saw a man under the helmet, seemingly sleeping peacefully. His forehead and the inside of his helmet had blood on them, and I would have thought that he was dead had I not seen the helmet getting fogged up every few seconds from his steady breathing. He had a name tag on his chest that said, Harrington. I found one. He's alive, but he seems to be injured, I said. All right, we'll bring him back and we'll decide later what to do with the station, Adam said. I detached the safety cord for myself and attached it to the astronaut. I held the cord with one hand and pressed the button on it. It began slowly pulling the both of us back towards the ship. All right, I got him. We're going back. I stared at the ISS-14 as it grew distant again, occasionally glancing at Harrington to see if he was still breathing. 
We had passed by the open airlock and I kept squinting at it, mesmerized and trying to take a closer look but it was too dark. When it was out of my line of sight, I glanced back at the astronaut. His eyes were wide open and he was staring at me. I stared at him for a while, not sure if he was dead or alive or catatonic, but then I saw him blink. He started darting his eyes around frantically. I finally broke free of my trance and said, Hey, it's okay, you're safe now. I'm from the Collector 3 and we were sent to rescue you. Harrington mumbled timidly. Rescue? Yeah, I don't know what happened, but you seem to be the only survivor. I'm bringing you back to our ship. At this sentence, Harrington's eyes widened even more and he started panting. Within seconds, he was writhing and screaming, shouting incoherent words. He almost shook me off the cord and I tried calming him down. But it was hard with the cacophony of radio voices asking what was going on and Harrington screaming and squirming. Hey, calm down. Calm down. I tried to hold him still, but it was impossible. Don't do it. Don't bring them back. I managed to grab those words among all the incoherence in Harrington's sentences. There's no one left of your crew. You're the only survivor. I shouted, but he continued ignoring me. And then he started coughing violently. Droplets of blood splashed the inside of his helmet, adding to the other already dried blood. He had a coughing fit for about half a minute and he took a few deep breaths. Then his eyes opened and he seemingly lost consciousness again. Ian, report in. Adam shouted over the radio. It took me a moment to recompose myself and then I answered. I think he has internal bleeding. We have to hurry. Riley, get the first aid kit ready. On it, Riley responded. Within minutes, Harrington and I were back in the airlock. I pressed the button and closed the external door and pressurized the chamber, putting Harrington in a lane position. As soon as the internal door opened, the crew rushed in and put Harrington on a stretcher, carrying him to the infirmary. I took off my helmet and with the suit still on, I followed them. Get his suit off, Riley's voice echoed through the ship. Harrington was lying on his back on a table, Riley on the side of it taking off his helmet. I got to the other side of the table and helped them take the suit off him. When I reached to help them take his garment off, the astronaut firmly gripped my wrist like a vice. Our eyes met and again he had that same petrified look on his face as before. He mumbled something, but I couldn't understand him. I leaned in and told him to repeat what he said. You brought them back, he said with a trembling voice. I looked down in time to see Riley take off Harrington's garment and an audible scream was heard from her, along with gasps from the other crew members. When I looked down, I could hardly comprehend what I was seeing. Harrington had a gaping hole in his stomach and in it. Hundreds of thousands of maggots were squirming around, eating away at his wound. They started hopping, some managing to jump onto Riley's arm. She screamed and violently swatted at them, making a break for the exit. Harrington started coughing again, more violently than before. Just before he stopped moving completely, the blood from his cough spurted over my suit and I recoiled. When I looked down, I nearly started screaming. Along with the blood, there were crimson maggots slithering towards my head. I swatted at them, disgusted and in a panic at the same time. Get out of here, Adam shouted. We didn't need any more encouragement. We rushed outside and once everybody was out, we pressed the button to lock the door. We glanced through the glass on the door at Harrington's body. More and more maggots squirmed out of Harrington's wound, and possibly many to fit into his stomach alone, swarming his exposed body parts and feasting away on his remains. Is everybody okay? Anyone get bit? Adams asked. Most of us nodded. Riley, what the heck was that? James asked. 
beads of sweat forming on his temples. Riley opened her mouth as if to say something, her gaze still fixed on the infirmary. She shook her head without saying anything. How the heck did he get maggots on him? I asked. Even if he had a necrotic wound, there's no way so many maggots could just come out of his stomach like that. Well, the only explanation is he or one of the crew members were infected and it got out of control, Adam said. Either way, it doesn't matter. We have to get in touch with HQ. He turned around and left the corridor and everybody else started towards the control room after him. Riley and I were at the back and as she started down the corridor, I grabbed her arm, a little firmer than I had planned to. She shot me a look of confusion as I stared at her exposed forearm. Riley, those things touched you. Did they bite you? I asked, silently enough for others not to hear. No. She said and jerked her arm free of my grip and looked at me as if she was offended. You think that I would just jeopardize the whole crew like that? I don't, I just... And what about you? The ISS member coughed up some maggots on you. I'm clean, I'm positive, I said with her eyes locked. She crossed her arms and seemed to calm down, she said. Well, we should all get tested anyway, but we don't have the necessary equipment here. Right, our priority should be contacting HQ and getting back. If any of us are infected, they can quarantine us. She nodded in motion for me to join the rest of the crew. We entered the control room and heard Carter's voice on the other end of the room. This is the U.S. Collector 3. HQ, do you copy? This is HQ. What's your situation, Collector? A voice came through. Move aside. Adams commanded Carter and pressed the button on the panel. HQ, this is Captain Adams. We arrived at the site of the ISS-14. Everyone but one crew member had died mysteriously. We managed to bring the crew member back on board, but he died shortly after. There was a brief moment of pause before HQ said, What happened? We don't know for sure. The crew member that we brought back seems to have been infected. He had flesh-eating maggots under his suit. We had to seal off the infirmary since we don't know the extent of the threat. Understood. Collector, right now your priority is sterilizing the contaminated areas in case these maggots can do some serious damage to the vessel. Once you've done that, haul butt back to base so that we can quarantine and treat you, if necessary. We're sending somebody out there right now. Copy that HQ, Collector out. Adams turned to us with his typical stern look and said, Well, you heard him. Let's first sterilize the infirmary. Hank pressed a button on the control panel. When nothing happened, he pressed it again. He flipped a switch up and down and pressed the button once more, before he started repeatedly slamming it. What's going on, Hank? Carter asked. Hank pressed the button a few more times before responding. The sterilization doesn't work. The button's not responding. Try some other rooms, Carter suggested. Hank did that and pressed various other buttons, but still no dice. Crap, now what? Riley mumbled. Adam sighed and turned to James. He said, James, I need you to put on the hazmat suit and decontaminate the infirmary manually. No way, James rebutted. Have you seen what those little angry things can do? I'm not going in there. You'll do your job. Adams got into James' face before calming down. Besides, the suit will protect you. He then said to Hank and Carter, Start the engine. Might as well get going while we're doing this. He turned around to approach the holographic map on the table when Carter spoke. Uh, Captain, the engine won't start. Adams turned back and frowned, now visibly frustrated. What do you mean it won't start? Start it. It won't start, Carter blurted. There was a moment of intense silence in the room. Adams rubbed his chin and then turned to me. 
Ian, check the engine, but put the protection suit on just in case. I gave him a silent nod of agreement and left the room. James followed behind me. This is stupid. He threw his hands up in the air as we made our way to the lockers. I'll suck it up, James. The sooner that we finish our job, the sooner we can go home. I scoffed. We donned our protective suits and inspected each other for potential faults and once we were sure everything was okay, I picked up my tools and we went our merry way. My job was to go onto the ship's bottom floor and inspect the engine and to do that, I had to remove the floor panel and climb down. As I did so and entered the corridor, I heard James, a trembling voice over the radio. Jesus Christ, Captain, I'm in front of the infirmary. There's more of them in here. What do you mean? Adams asked. I mean there's millions of them. They're all over the place. I can't even see Harrington's body anymore. Jesus. My stomach started twisting into knots. I didn't like this at all. Adams continued. James, just calm down. Listen, we have to decontaminate the room before they spread to the other parts of the ship. Your suit will protect you. Pull the switch, wait until the process is done and get out. All right, all right. James sighed over the radio. I'm going in. Adam spoke to me and asked how things were going on my end and I told him that I was close to the engine. It was darker down here so I used a flashlight to illuminate the way in front. The corridor echoed with the heavy thuds of my footsteps as I made my way through until I reached the panel above my head which said, Do not remove. James, talk to me, Adam said. I'm still okay, Captain, but I had to stomp all over them. It's disgusting. They seem to be ignoring me, though. Did you pull the switch? I pulled on my screwdriver and started to unscrew the panel off. Not yet, but I'm almost. Ah, oh, God, James shouted. James, what happened? Adam asked. Something just bit me, James yelled. Now, James, that's impossible. They can't get through your suit. It's made out of... Oh, there's a hole in my boot. I gotta get out of here. My heart was thumping against my chest rapidly at this point, and I had stopped doing my own job. My left hand frozen on the panel and the other on the screw. They're in my suit. God, James shouted. Get out of there, Adam shouted loudly. The next few seconds were filled with James' screams over the radio, intermittently getting louder and quieter until they had stopped completely. James, I shouted, my own voice trembling now. There was no response. However, Adam shouted again. Ian, get out of there. All right, let me just fix the engine. Ian, forget the engine and get back here now. now hold on, if I fix the engine we can... The panel partially fell open when I took the second screw off and from the gap, hundreds of red maggots poured through, falling to the ground with wet slumps. I recoiled in fear as the maggots continued to pour out and pile in the ground in front of me. They started bouncing one by one trying to reach me. I screamed and bolted for the ladder. All the while, the voices of my crew members echoed through the radio, asking me what was going on. I climbed up and slammed the floor panel shut, leaving me with only the sound of my own frantic breathing. And then I heard a thud, and then another and another. In moments, hundreds of thuds were heard in the panel, like the sound of rainfall and I could see the floor bending outwards under the pressure. Maggots started crawling from under the edges of the dented panel and I screamed again, running for dear life. Ian, respond. Abandoned ship, I shouted between breaths, looking back behind me. I could already see thousands of maggots on the ground and walls behind me. What's going on, Adam shouted. Maggots everywhere. Get to your suits, we have to run. I ran straight to the locker and took off my protective suit, donning the space one instead, my trembling hands making it difficult to suit up. The rest of the crew members were there in a matter of seconds putting their own suits on. No time for inspection, get to the airlock, 
Adam shouted. I ran out first, rushing down the corridor, and I stopped when I glanced at the infirmary. James was slumped over the threshold, leaving the door open. He had managed to take his suit off down to his waist before he died. Maggots were wiggling inside his empty eye socket and his teeth were visible due to his lips being completely eaten. His body in the areas in front and inside the infirmary were crawling with maggots, possibly millions, piling atop each other on every single surface of the room, making it look like it was moving with their slithering. Go! Adams pushed me and I forced myself to look away and continue running. We rushed inside the airlock and as I turned around, I saw Hank lagging behind running towards us. His right arm had maggots on it, which he seemingly wasn't aware of. All of us were probably thinking the same thing, but nobody wanted to say it. That's why Adams stepped up and closed the airlock before Hank could get inside. Hank slammed the button to open the airlock from the outside, but it wasn't responsive during the pressurization. Captain, let me in. They're close. He looked behind at the mass, which drew closer by the second. Hank, I'm so sorry, Adam said. Hank started screaming and flailing his arms. Maggot started appearing in his helmet and he threw it off, trying to run in the opposite direction in a desperate attempt to escape. He never stood a chance, since the maggots swarmed up to his knees in seconds and trapped him like quicksand, before he was completely covered by them. Riley screamed and cried, trying to put her hands on her mouth but unable to because of the helmet. Opening airlock. The door opened and all went silent again. Never before has the inhospitable vacuum of space felt so welcoming. For a while, we floated in silence processing what had just happened, and then Adam spoke up, a sentence which sent a chill down my spine so sharply that for a moment, I thought that I myself had maggots in my suit. We need to get to the ISS-14, he said somberly. Riley and I shot each other a confused stare but said nothing. Adams was already well on his way to the airlock of the ISS-14, slowly propelling himself with his thrusters. Carter followed closely behind and soon the entire group of survivors was unanimously headed towards the silent behemoth of a ship. Captain, there might be maggots on there, I said. Oh, I know. Adams' voice came tiredly through, but some of us are low on oxygen. We need to replenish it and, if possible, repressurize the station. We need to contact HQ and warn them of the dangers here before those maggots spread. Even though no one responded, it was clear that we all agreed. After all, we had only two choices. Drift around in the vacuum of space until help came, or try to find shelter inside. Both options seemed equally daunting. What the heck are those things? Space maggots? Carter asked. Whatever they are, they can't be allowed to go back to Earth. Adams responded. We reached the airlock of the ISS-14 and went inside. The entire ship seemed to be dark, so we turned on our belt flashlights. Should we close the hatch? Riley asked. Yeah, might as well. But if the station is infested, we might have a better chance surviving in the vacuum. So be ready for a quick venting, Adam said, slowly propelling himself deeper into the station. Carter clicked the button to close the exterior airlock door and once we were inside, he closed the interior one as well. Adams went ahead, the corridor illuminated by his flashlight like a wave of light. We followed him, nervously jumping at every tiny detail on the walls which resembled maggots or it seemed like it was moving. All the doors are open except the control room, Adam said. Yeah, so? Carter asked. They may have vented the station from there. Common procedure is that in case any venting needs to be done, all astronauts are to put on their suits and head to the control room. Well, let's see if anybody is inside, I said. Adams nodded and pressed the button next to the door. 
a message popped up that said, Warning, pressure inside the room is higher than the pressure outside. Do you wish to equalize pressure? Adams clicked on yes. Equalizing pressure, stand by. The message blinked on and off for a few minutes and I felt myself becoming heavier gradually as the gravity adjusted until all four of us were with our feet on the floor. The display turned to green as it said. Pressure adjusted. Warning, emergency power online. Oxygen production offline. Please use emergency O2 stations to replenish your O2. The door slid aside and we were met with a dim red glow of the control room. Immediately we saw the body of an astronaut lying face down in the corner of the room. Riley rushed to the crew member and turned to herself, but her look of vague hope turned to disappointment. She's dead, she said. The rest of us approached and saw the astronaut's face. It was a young woman no older than 30, blue in the face, but despite the color of her skin, she looked like she was sleeping peacefully. Her name tag said, Moody. She's holding something, Carter said. We glanced down and saw what looked like a camcorder in her hand. Adam snatched it and opened it and the rest of us gathered around him. There was a folder open and Adams highlighted the first video by date. It started playing. The video was from the perspective of one of the astronauts, male judging by the voice. He was hovering above the ISS and zooming in on something on top of the ship. When he zoomed in enough, it became visible that there was some sort of red egg floating around. If he was saying anything, we couldn't hear him in the vacuum of space. The video cut out and the next frame showed the astronaut gently holding the object from the previous footage in his hand. The red egg had veiny marks on it and it was slightly bigger than the astronaut's palm. The astronaut flipped the egg from side to side, examining it curiously. The video ended there. Adams played the next video. The frame showed the egg from before, now in a glass display case inside the station. What the heck is that? The person recording now a female scientist had asked. No idea. Another voice responded. Harrington found it outside and HQ wanted it brought back. What if it's dangerous? The female astronaut said. Well, whatever it is, it won't break this case. Nothing can. Oh, the scanner shows no signs of activity inside the egg. A third voice said. The camera zoomed in on the egg before the video ended abruptly. Adams played the next one. The video showed the same room as before, but now the camera was placed on the desk, since we could see Moody sitting by it facing the camera. A base wants the egg tested, she said to the camera. They don't want to risk bringing the egg to Earth, so I've been appointed as lead scientist. My job is to monitor the egg and conduct tests to see what's inside. So far, there's nothing strange about the egg itself. Maybe it's not even an egg. I'll continue to run tests. She reached out for the camera and the video ended. The next video showed the same scene and a visibly more tired Moody. She rubbed her eyes and faced the camera before saying, Another egg was found today. Nilsson was performing a module check when he saw it. Despite initial skepticism, the egg will be taken back to base for study. There were apparently more and all seemed to be coming from one direction. There may be a nest close by. As for this one, she looked back at the egg and then at the camera. There seemed to be some signs of minor activity inside. It's hard to tell what it is though. Whatever it is, it could be our actual first contact. She ended the video. I heard Carter mumble, oh my god, under his breath. Adams played the next video. The footage showed the same egg from before, but it was now cracked at the top and on the side. Tiny crimson maggots were squirming around the display case lazily. What are those? Moody asked. 
Alien worms? A voice next to her had asked. Was the egg rotted? She inquired. It didn't look like it. Maybe the worms are supposed to hatch out of it. No idea. One of the maggots started slithering on the glass and moving upwards. The camera zoomed in and I clearly saw the bodies of the maggots crawling over each other. It looked like they had tiny hairs on their bodies. The video ended. I felt itchy all over my body, unable to shake the feeling of bugs crawling all over me. The next video showed Moody in the same room. There were visibly a lot more maggots inside the display, she said. They are reproducing at an enormous pace. The maggots seem to be dormant in the vacuum but able to survive. Keith followed the trace where the eggs are coming from and says that he found their nest close by. It seems that this really is going to be first contact. He hasn't responded to our call yet though, so the signal must be bad there. The video ended and there was only one more video remaining. Adams played it. The frame was shaky but we saw what was clearly the room from the previous footages. However, this time, the glass display was broken and there were countless maggots all over the place, covering every inch of the floor and every piece of item and furniture inside the room. The egg inside the display was broken into pieces now, and barely visible from all the maggots crawling all over it. Moody, move! Someone shouted. Moody panted in panic and pressed the button to lock the door. She pointed the camera left down the hallway and thousands more maggots came into view. Moody turned around and ran. A blood-curdling scream was heard somewhere before it was completely silenced. Moody ran inside the control room and turned around. Harrington came into view with the spacesuit. He pressed the button to lock the door from outside and shouted, Moody, vent the station. Wait, what about you and the others? No time, I'll open the second airlock. Get ready. He ran out of view, ignoring Moody's pleas to stop. Another scream was heard over Moody's radio. She stood in the room, panting in panic and looking over her shoulder. Moody, do it! Harrison shouted. Moody approached a panel in the corner of the room and opened it, revealing a big switch. She grabbed it and held it hesitantly. Moody, don't! I can't get to my spacesuit! Another crew member's voice came through. Do it! Harrington shouted. Moody was audibly crying by this moment. With hesitation, she pulled the switch down and heard another short-lived scream. The video cut out and came back the following second, showing Moody in a dimly lit room with red lights gasping for air. She pointed the camera towards herself. Tears were streaming down her face. She exhaled with a trembling voice and said, Oxygen production was damaged. I only have a few minutes left. HQ doesn't know what happened and everybody else is dead. All the maggots have been vented out but the nest is still out there. Whoever finds this, you have to destroy the nest. It's close by. The coordinates are on the wall here. She pointed the camera at a wall, then we unanimously looked at the numbers on the wall which were still there. Moody took a few shallow breaths and said, Also, please send my final message to my sister. She started sobbing more. Haley, I'm so sorry. You were right. Space is really bad. I wish that I would have listened to you. I'm glad Mom isn't alive to witness this. I'm sorry for being so stubborn. I'll always love you, little sister. She sniffled and cried before turning off the camera. The four of us stared at the blank screen in silence. Jesus, Carter muttered. So what now? I asked. Adam sighed and gently placed the camcorder next to Moody's body. We're going to the nest, he said with determination. Whoa, Captain, you can't be serious. Carter said. Carter, you can stay if you like. Adam said and looked at Riley and I. Same goes for you two. Wait for a rescue if you like, but I have to finish this. No way, Captain, I'm coming with you, I said. 
Riley agreed to come too, so in the end, Carter threw his hands up in the air and said that he would come along as well. All right, and then let's do this, Adam said. We replenished our tanks and found whatever could be used as a weapon. There were no guns aboard the ISS, which probably wouldn't be useful against bugs anyway. So instead, we grabbed lighters, deodorant cans, and pieces of cloth that we could set on fire. Before we knew it, we were back outside in the vacuum of space. Adams led the way, propelling himself through, with the three of us following closely behind. How do we even know how this place looks? Carter asked. For all we know, it could just be a floating nest and long gone from that location. No choice, Adams replied. We gotta find that thing. If not for us, somebody else will have to do it. We're not paid to do this sort of. Carter, if you're just gonna be a baby the whole time, then turn back and get out of here. Adams shouted. And Carter hadn't responded. We flew in silence for a while until Riley spotted some tiny object in the distance. It looked round and reddish. What the heck is that? I asked, immediately suspecting the one thing. Adams flew there and grabbed the object, inspecting it curiously. He turned to us so that we could observe it as well. An egg, just like in Moody's footage, he said, letting the egg float. Indeed, it looked exactly like the red veiny egg in the video. I saw more details than in the video though. In addition to the bulging veins, there were thin orange ones on the inside, visible on the surface. It reminded me of the time when I cracked open an egg and instead of the yolk, saw an embryo of a chick. Adams grabbed his spray can and lighter. Everybody back up, he said. He flicked the lighter on and the flame appeared, moving not upwards like a normal gravity, but dancing in various directions, almost like when blood starts to flow underwater. Adams put the spray can behind the flame and pressed the button. Although we heard no sound, we saw the wave of flame expanding like a torch and setting the egg aflame. Immediately, we saw little maggots wriggling out and going for the captain, but Adams didn't let up with the flame, his face intense with revenge and anger, the flame reflecting from his helmet. He was practically burning them to a crisp. Even after the egg was nothing more than a burnt shell, he continued burning it. Uh, Captain, you got them, let's go, Carter said. Adams finally let up, observing his artistic piece of work before letting out one more gust of flame and then turning around. Let's go, he said emotionlessly. We were far ahead of the ISS by this point, a good 20 minutes since we left. The station seemed tiny from here and we were mere specks of dust floating through space, surrounded by miles and miles of vast and nothingness. The captain, we still on the right track, I asked. Adams kept quiet for a moment and then pointed over yonder. Riley, Carter, and I looked in the distance that he was pointing in, and there it was. Some kind of object in the distance. It was hard to tell what it was, but it looked rectangular, human-made, and not crude like a piece of rock from space. We started seeing eggs more frequently floating past us, but there were too many to deal with individually, so we just let them be. As we got closer, it became clearer that the object that we were seeing was indeed like a cube greenish in color with black lines going along the edges like columns. Is this it? Carter asked. It was big, a lot bigger than I had anticipated, easily towering over 50 feet on each side. Right in front of us was a rectangular shaped entrance near the bottom part of the cube object. One egg floated out of there, spinning in the air. Adams pushed it out of the way and illuminated the entrance. It had the same kind of green and black colors like on the exterior, but nothing noteworthy about it. He looked at me and gestured with his head for me to go in. I did as he said and I gasped in awe at what I saw. The interior looked exactly like the exterior but the greenish lines that went along the walls or floors or ceilings 
glowing color that gave off the vibe of a radioactive material, showering me and my crew members in a sickly green. I realized that there were a few eggs strewn about, firmly stuck on the walls in some sort of gooey substance. What the heck? This must be the nest, Captain. Are you seeing this? Carter asked. When we got no response from Adams, we shot around to see what was going on. Before we had realized what was happening, the exit slid shut and Adams was out of sight, the green glowing brighter now. Captain, I shouted. For a moment, there was only silence and then Adams spoke. I'm sorry guys, I didn't want to do this. You see, these worms aren't just flesh-eating parasites. The maggots can devour things quickly, yes, and they can reproduce quickly too. But they are also intelligent beyond our comprehension. My heart was beating fast at this moment and I got a really bad feeling. Captain, open this door. Carter slammed on the wall which was previously an open space. Adams continued. They can get inside the host and devour him from the inside in a matter of seconds, taking control of the body. You see, Adams wasn't careful enough when evacuating the ship, and the three of you didn't care enough to check him for any marks. I can't allow you to stop this process. Carter started slamming the door harder, Riley visibly panicky and I kept glancing around to see if any of the eggs had hatched by any chance. But just then a voice came over our radio. ISS-14, this is HQ. Is anybody still alive there? HQ, we're here. We got a situation. I shouted into the radio. A moment later, HQ said again, This is HQ. Is anybody alive out there? I tried again along with Riley and Carter, but they couldn't hear us. And then Adam spoke. HQ, this is Captain Adams of the Collector. There are no other survivors, and I'm on my way to you now. Copy that, Adams. We'll stand by, HQ said. We tried contacting HQ again, but to no avail. Either Adams had jammed our signal or it was blocked inside the structure. Just then, I caught something with my peripheral vision. One of the eggs had started to hatch and maggots were wriggling out of it. We gotta get out of here, I said. Carter was still busy slamming the door and trying to contact HQ, unaware of the eggs hatching. Carter, we gotta get out of here now, I said. He finally realized the severity of our situation and all three of us started propelling each other through the structure, using spray cans and lighters to burn everything and anything that got anywhere close to our vicinity. We had the advantage of the structure being spacious and the worms not being able to jump around in the vacuum so we were relatively safe, except for the ones that made their way accidentally to us. The structure seemed to wind around as a corridor, eggs and slime decorating most of its interior. I had started to lose hope and thought that this place would become my tomb, leaving my body to float in the vacuum of space for hundreds of years. But then we saw the exit in the form of a square-shaped hole. We propelled ourselves out, turning around only to burn the rest of the maggots that had stumbled outside. Crap! Crap! Carter screamed, swatting at his own hand and trying to grab something, but it was too late. There was already a tiny hole in his suit, letting out a steady gust of air. Carter grabbed his helmet with both hands. The shocking realization of what he was about to do hit me and I tried to stop him. Carter, no! No! I shouted, but it was too late. Carter twisted and his helmet came off. Instantly, his face had started contorting into one of palpable pain and changing colors. I tried to put his helmet back on, but he pushed me and threw the helmet further away. You would think that dying in the vacuum of space is a relatively quick process, but it's not. It is very slow and very painful. Carter convulsed his face turning blue and bloating, his eyes turning bloodshot for what felt like minutes until he stopped moving completely and was left floating in the air as a ragdoll. Ian, we gotta go. Riley sobbed and I knew that she was right. 
We tried contacting HQ, but it didn't work. So we simply flew back to the ISS as quickly as we could. We had to stop Adams or whatever those maggots controlling him were. After around 20 minutes, we finally got back and saw another ship waiting nearby. We were greeted by the crew members who needed a few minutes to understand what we were rambling about. When I finally asked them about Adams, they said that he had already left with the other team. We tried to explain what had happened, but nobody believed us. We had to tell them to go and check out the structure for themselves, but to bring flamethrowers. That took another hour, and when they came back with two less men, they asked us to tell them everything. Adams had returned to Earth by then. When we came back, we got information that he had volunteered to be on the team which is running tests on the alien egg brought back to Earth. Again, they refused to believe our claims that he was being controlled by space maggots, so we knew that we had to take care of things ourselves. It's been two days, but Riley and I managed to get to the base. I'm afraid that this will be my last mission, though. I discovered a tiny wound on my right hand when I got back to Earth. There's no pain or anything, but something's wrong. I can feel it. First, I lost control of my hand and now my entire right arm. It's moving, but not by my own action. I can already feel part of my neck doing involuntary movement, so I'm afraid that I'm a goner. Adams needs to be stopped and the egg destroyed. Even so, I feel like this is a losing battle that we're fighting. The structure out in space was made by someone or something other than humans. And they put those eggs in there for a reason. There's nothing worse than waking up in a cold sweat, ruining a perfectly good night of sleep. If it's night terror as well, I can't help you there. But if you're just a naturally hot sleeper, then listen up. Ghostbed is here for you. As the makers of the coolest beds in the world, Ghostbed is your go-to for cooling mattresses, cooling pillows, and even cooling bedding. From their signature ghost ice fabric to patented technology that adjusts with your body temperature, every Ghostbed mattress is designed with cooling in mind. So whether you want a plusher mattress that cushions your shoulders and hips, or a firmer option with exceptional support, your ghost bed will keep you cool and comfortable all night long. We love ghost bed here, so we're excited to share an exclusive deal for our listeners. For a limited time, get 40% off all ghost bed mattresses, plus get two luxury pillows. Just use promo code Mr. Creeps at ghostbed.com slash creepscast to take advantage of the exclusive offer. That's www.ghostbed.com slash creepscast with promo code Mr. Creeps. Now I enjoy exercising quite a bit and whether it be going for a run or playing basketball at my local park. I do enjoy it, but the soreness and pain that comes afterwards isn't always the best. I had been searching for a remedy for a while when I stumbled upon a CBD, and it's definitely helped with the after-workout pain. CB Distillery has been my go-to ever since for CBD products because they only use 100% clean ingredients. That means no artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives. And with over 2 million satisfied customers, you know that they're reliable. If you're frustrated with a health concern that's not getting better, try CBD from the source that I trust, cbdistillery.com. Let me get you on the right path with my 20% discount. Just visit cbdistillery.com and enter my code Mr. Creeps for your discount. No prescription required. That's cbdistillery.com. Promo code Mr. Creeps for 20% off. That's cbdistillery.com. <laughs> 